visitors to Europe read their guidebooks, but when en route to Berlin, they study the headlines. Americans who tend to think of Europe as the past know that Berlin is different. The lesson that begins when one steps off the plane at Tempelhof Airport is very much a chapter in modern history. Only minutes away stands what is now the sign of a city divided by barbed wire and concrete wall, symbol of how Germany itself has been divided by naked communist force. Along this grotesque border, there is a continuous alert. Communists on the Brandenburg Gate in the heart of Europe. What does this mean for all of us? And how did it happen? In the 1920s, the Brandenburg Gate stood at the crossroads of one of Europe's busiest capitals. The temple of Berlin's life in those days was famous and not unsuited to the sightseeing pace of the average tourist, even then. Berlin was not only the capital of the Weimar Republic, it was the Athens of the North, a center of arts and sciences on the continent. When the spirit of Berlin's Humboldt University was still free, it produced 21 Nobel Prize winners. Physicists like Einstein and Planck, sculptors like Barlock and Kolbe, painters like Nolde and Gross, conductors like Furtwangler, stage directors like Max Reinhardt were the glory of the city and gave it its special glow. But in the late 20s came the worldwide depression and hit Germany terribly hard. No facade of normalcy could hide the misery and despair that fed on mass unemployment. The days of Germany's tender young republic were numbered. Its enemies were already preparing to seize power. The history of that tragedy is too well known. So is its evil architect, the man who promised his people a new order, but who brought them in the entire world the chaos of war. He talked of victory, when all thinking Germans knew the war was lost. Herr Churchill mag der Überzeugung sein, dass Großbritannien siegen wird. Ich zweifle keine Sekunde, dass Deutschland siegt. By spring 1945, Berlin was a rubble heap. May 2nd, the German forces surrendered. For the first time in weeks, the Berliners dared to venture into the open. What they saw was almost more horrible than the darkness of their cellars. The sun that spring shone on a dead city. Hitler had shot himself his chancellery was a ruin. The victors met at Potsdam. Attlee, Great Britain, Truman, the United States, Stalin, the Soviet Union, the big three. The war was won. But what of the peace? What was to become of Germany? And what of its capital, Berlin? One-fourth of Germany in the east was split off and put under Polish and Soviet administration until a peace treaty could be signed. The rest of Germany was to be treated as an economic unit. Agreement on the occupation had previously been reached by the Big Three in the London Protocol of September 1944. That agreement divided Germany into three occupation zones and into a special Berlin territory. Later, France joined the occupation. Berlin was clearly excluded from the Soviet zone on the official map that is part of the London Protocol. The map, too, was signed by the Soviets as well as the protocol. It was thus clear that Berlin does not belong to the Soviet zone, but is a special territory. True, Berlin had been conquered by Soviet troops, but British and American arms took almost half of what is now the Soviet zone, a territory of eight million people, which they handed over to the Reds in accordance with the London Protocol, while the Soviets, in turn, gave up West Berlin. Just like Germany was divided into zones, 
Berlin was divided into four sectors, which were, however, to be administered jointly. Access routes, including three air corridors, were agreed on leading through 110 miles of the Soviet zone. The Allied Covenant Tura governed Berlin while the Allied Control Authority concerned itself with all of Germany. Four flags flew over one nation, over one city. But the Soviets vetoed many four-power actions with their Nyet. Still, Berlin was reborn. It was the women who started the painful work. They hoped their men would return from the prisoner of war camps to build anew with those bricks. Others combed the countryside, looking for food. The air raid sirens had stopped. The children could play again. For them, peace had already come. But there was never enough to eat. The Soviets refused to supply Berlin from their zone. It was America that came to the rescue. It soon became apparent that the Soviets wanted no four-power responsibility in Berlin. Their aim was to take over the whole city. In March 1948, they left the control authority. When the West issued a new stable currency in its sectors, the Soviets blockaded all access to West Berlin in an undisguised attempt to bring the city to its knees. The West took up the challenge. General Clay ordered an airlift. In the next 11 months, every ounce of food, every pound of coal was supplied from the air. The Berliners lived in a state of siege. Transport was severely cut. There was little heat or power. But where there's a will, there's a way. Every patch of green was used to grow food. Though the winter was dark and cold and the Berliners froze, they did not give up. Ihr Völker der Welt, ihr Völker in Amerika, in England, in Frankreich, in Italien, schaut auf diese Stadt. Their spokesman was Mayor Ernst Reuter, who had fought Nazi tyranny. On behalf of his people, he appealed to the world. The airlift continued. At Christmas time, American airmen found time to bring candy to Berlin's youngsters. The distinction of victor and vanquished began to disappear that winter in the common cause of fighting the Soviet blockade. Even seaplanes helped supply the city. Grateful Berliners said thank you with flowers. Though the children learned to play airlift, Grown-ups knew it was no game. 77 men lost their lives. 41 Britons, 31 Americans, and 5 Germans. And then, the blockade was broken. At midnight, May 2nd, 1949, the barriers were lifted. The Soviets promised free, even improved, access to Berlin. Daring and persistence had saved the freedom of West Berlin by peaceful means. The spirit of the Berliners had won through. But during the blockade, the Soviets had divided the city further. Communist rowdies stormed the Greater Berlin City Hall, located in the East Sector. Though some who were forced into the demonstration showed little enthusiasm, the strong armed tactics achieve their goal. Non-communist deputies were forced to establish their government in West Berlin, where they could meet without being molested, and elections could be free. Berlin was divided. Not only was the city administration split, but streetcar lines, gas, light, and power systems were cut in two. The Reds even prohibited telephone calls between East and West Berlin. Picture this happening in New York City, with the dividing line running through Times Square. Alarm at the Communist Police Headquarters, June 17, 1953. 
the workers of East Berlin rose up against their communist masters, as did workers all over the Soviet zone. Without weapons or organization, with their bare fists alone, the East Berliners faced the heavily armed soldiers of the Red Regime. Three years before the revolution in Hungary, for the first time, proletarians fought against the dictatorship of the proletariat. The red flag was torn down from the Brandenburg Gate. But German communist rulers had to call on the Soviets for help against their own people. Only Soviet tanks could crush the revolt. It is clear the entire Soviet zone regime rests on these tanks. Meanwhile, Free West Berlin began to rebuild. With the city cut off from its natural hinterland, help had to come from the free world. And it came. America's Marshall Plan provided one billion dollars. West Germany supplied more billions. The Berliners themselves worked hard and efficiently. They remade their city. The most modern urban highways in all Europe were cut through West Berlin. Today, West Berlin is once again Germany's most important industrial center. It now produces more each year than do half the member states of the United Nations. The student guide may be reluctant to interpret this sculptor to our American guests, but she's proud of the freedom West Berlin offers to the modern artist. She calls the Airlift Memorial the Hunger Rake. Berliners are quick with apt nicknames. Pregnant Oyster is what they call the Congress Hall, built with American aid. Kerr Furstendam is a combination of Fifth Avenue and Broadway. It's the scene each September of the Cultural Festival, and every June it's home to the Film Festival with its glamorous stars. But the true stars of Berlin's own girls, their chic, wit, and self-assurance have a big city flavor with a special Berlin accent, a charm not lost on many a young man away from home. This is Kurfürstendamm, the main stem of a metropolis. More typical for the Berliner are the streets of his own neighborhood. The organ grinder is still a part of that scene. So are the small garden plots all over town, where giant pumpkins grow and families spend their summer weekends. Berlin is famous for its good climate. In summer, it may get almost as hot as New York, but never half as humid. There is much history connected with Berlin, but sightseeing is always tiring. Fortunately, there are many beautiful areas within the island city, woods and fields, lakes and rivers. In summer, the Berliners flock to these spots, hungry for sun and air. But what do they find? More Berliners. They cannot go too far, just a few yards, and there are the borders again. While well, the lakes get quiet in the evening, Kurfürstendamm gets livelier. Despite the political situation, the city planners build for tomorrow from these models of a city united. But at night, even Berliners want to forget politics. Little America in the heart of Berlin. The American army community has its own schools and kindergartens. its own shopping center, its own radio station. American Music Hall comes to you from Berlin. And now this is your host, Army PSC Jim Sutton. Its own, <laughs> this needs no explanation. 
Nor this. Reveille comes early in the barracks. The soldiers know they have a job to do. Dawn training in the Berlin woods is tough and real. The soldiers of the Western Allies stationed in Berlin are proof of the free world's determination to counter power with power if necessary. They know they stand guard here not only for Berlin, but for the United States, for Britain, for France, for freedom in the whole world. Only a few miles away in East Berlin is the center of communist power on German soil. Women in arms, communist factory brigades trained for civil war. Perhaps not a very dependable army, but then there are the Russian comrades. And here is Big Brother himself. The great dictator embraces the little dictator, but the Germans have had enough of dictatorship. They fled by the thousands to West Berlin, voting with their feet against communism. They filled the refugee camps in West Berlin, leaving behind their homes, friends, and possessions. After a short wait in the camps, an airplane ticket became their passport to a new existence in West Germany. Since war's end, almost four million people fled, every fourth inhabitant of the Soviet zone. That did not please him at all. August 13, 1961. Communist police and militia occupy the entire border around... Church entrances were walled up. While the street entrances in West Berlin, the church itself stands in the Soviet sector. Witnesses to these events were unwanted. The so-called People's Police made every effort not to be photographed. Talking across the wall was prohibited. The massive weapons on the communist side of the sector border made armed protection on the western side essential. The communists surrounded the entire city with barbed wire to seal off West Berlin as an escape hatch. Watchtowers and death strips cut through the woods mark where communist rule begins. At first, one could still wave between east and west. East Berliners who lived near the border were forcibly driven from their homes. In this task, too, the communists disliked witnesses, but not even tear gas could hide the truth. Many dramatic last-minute flights took place from houses that border on West Berlin territory. What desperation, what will to be free must it take for a woman of 76 to jump from her window? Every flight is at the risk of death, and sometimes death is the winner. There were last goodbyes across the barbed wire, under the eyes of the communist guards, and then double and triple walls were built to prevent the last contacts. guards were also forced to watch each other. Even for them, escape is not easy. At a border cemetery, West Berliners encouraged this young guard to follow his conscience. At first, he was afraid.
Then he saw his chance and took it. Even for the wedding of their daughter in West Berlin, the parents could only wave from a distance. For the mass of East Berliners and East Germans, there is no way out of their giant red prison. To call attention to their plight and that of their brothers in the East, the people of West Berlin gathered soon after August 13th in a mass demonstration. The people of the free world heard the call. Vice President Johnson came and assured the Berliners that to the survival and the creative future of this city, we Americans pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. General Clay came too, the father of the airlift. The next day, American and British reinforcements came for their garrisons in Berlin. It was more a symbolic reinforcement, but the Berliners saw that they were not to be abandoned. The Berliners know that Western strength is their only protection. They know that one free nation after another has been swallowed up by the red rulers of the Kremlin. The record in Europe alone is shameful. 1939, Eastern Poland. 1940, the Baltic States, parts of Finland and Romania. 1944, Yugoslavia. 1945, Poland and East Germany. 1946, Albania and Bulgaria. 1947, Romania. 1948, Czechoslovakia. 1949, Hungary. 1961, East Berlin. Were West Berlin to lose its freedom too, all of Europe would feel threatened. Frankfurt, Brussels, and Paris are no great distance from the Red Empire now. The West knows this and is united in its determination to defend freedom in West Berlin and throughout the world. We are staying not alone in the world. Das Recht steht auf unserer Seite. Uns auf unserer Seite stehen die Völker der Welt, die die Freiheit lieben. Serait incorporé au territoire placé sous dictature autoritaire. It isn't enough just to sign agreements. It is absolutely essential to have the assurances that these agreements will be rigorously adhered to. June 26, 1963, the President of the United States comes to Berlin. The Berliners turn his motorcade tour to the city hall into a triumphal procession. There are many people in the world who really don't understand, or say they don't, what is the great issue between the free world and the communist world. Let them come to Berlin. There are some who say, there are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Lost the not Berlin in common. Let them come to Berlin. Freedom has many difficulties. And democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in, to prevent them from leaving us.
freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. All, all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. Barely five months later, within hours of the president's murder, tens of thousands of Berliners again turn out in spontaneous mourning for the man who said, I am a Berliner. A German city grieves for an American president. Shortly before Christmas 1963, something is achieved which few thought possible. The wall in Berlin is opened, a little. West Berliners are allowed to apply for special permits to visit relatives in East Berlin. And though it means hours of waiting in the bitter cold, the number of West Berliners bent again on seeing the faces of their brothers and sisters, parents and children, swells to mass proportions. Hundreds of thousands stream to East Berlin for the first time since the wall was built. Soon after New Year's Day, the gates are slammed, the wall is resealed. Yet the Berliners have brought new hope onto the German scene. Their city is divided as is their nation. But this division, this inhumanity cannot last forever. It never has in the history of man. <laughs> 